my name is Terry and I'm one of the rangers at Andersonville National Historic Site. Um, we're here with Mike Woods today at the Museum of Aviation in Warner Robins, Georgia. Um, and we want to talk to you today. You guys are one of our partners on the Georgia World War II Heritage Trail. Mm -hmm. We want to talk to you guys about uh, the B-17. I know you're working on a restoration project, so Mike, could you just give us some rundown of the importance of the um, aircraft during the World War II and just what you guys have done to restore this one? Wonderful. Well, Terry and Grace, thank you both for uh, having me and uh, coming in and visiting us. Uh, we love showing off our gal. We're very proud of her. Um, she was built and came off the assembly line in May of 1945, which was the month Germany surrendered. So and she's actually a Douglas bird. Doug, uh, Boeing designed this aircraft in the mid 1930s. I think the first photo prototype flew in 35. And um, so at the height of the war, the production process was so Expe you know, sped up that uh, they couldn't keep up with the demand, the aircraft that they purchased, uh, Boeing. So they subcontracted out to two other manufacturers, Lockheed Vega and Douglas, to help build these airplanes. Um, literally, they weren't in uh, Willow Run, where they were building the B-24s, they were coming off one every 55 minutes. I don't think they were that sped up uh, at the Boeing plants, but um, pretty close. So um, they built, a, Boeing built about half of these planes. Uh, 12,897, I believe, almost 13,000. Uh, and Douglas and Lockheed built the rest. And she was the last production run. Uh, it was a, this is a Block 90, a G model. And like I mentioned, she never went to war. The Army Air Corps took delivery of her off the line and uh, put her in storage. And I think she was in storage until 1949, where then the U.S. Air Force took her out of storage and converted her to a special mission uh, role. It was uh, a mothership, they, they call it, uh, drone director. Yes, they had drones back then. And they were heavily involved in the nuclear weapons testing programs. Um, they would detonate a weapon either in New Mexico or Nevada out west. And um, this aircraft, would take, would, a living crew would take this aircraft up and it was heavily modified with radios and transmitters and, um, and it would remotely control empty aircraft, other B-17s that were modified to be drones, you know, one of a few types of aircraft, and fly those aircraft near the nuclear we uh, d weapons detonation or actually fly B-17s through the mushroom cloud just to see what it would do. Those drones had air data collection bags in the bomb bay and they would gather data and uh, of course the airplane would come through the cloud and they, they turn the airplane around remotely, the, turn the drone around and land it back at the airfield and they would always land hot, uh, radioactive. So a living crew would come out with their suits on and take air data samples and look at the skin and do what they needed to do and then uh, inevitably they were bulldozed into the ground to, to be covered up because they were radioactive. We lost a lot of aircraft that way. So she actually saw some time in the Pacific. She went over there for the uh, hydrogen bomb shots, Ivy Mike, at a Kwajalein and Anawitok, and uh, she did some work there. And if I, if I was reading, in, around 60 or 61, um, President Kennedy was put a morator, putting a moratorium on above ground blasts. So the project pretty much wrapped up, and we had all the data we needed. So the last time she flew was 1961. They flew her into Bunker Hill Air Force Base, and um, Indiana and Bunker Hill Air Force Base, later the name was changed to um, Grissom Air Force Base in honor of the astronaut, Gus Grissom. And she sat there uh, guarding the front gate in a field. Uh, they had put paint on her. She flew aluminum, um, her 11 years of flying, but uh, they put paint on her and dressed her up to look European, you know. <laughs> and uh, and uh, literally they, they, they didn't have the, uh, the resources to keep the aircraft up. We wanted a B-17 here at the museum, and we uh, queried the, uh, the National Museum of the Air Force at Wright Patton, Dayton, Ohio, and asked, can we take her? We can not only put her in a hangar, but we can restore her. They weren't able to do that at Grissom. So um, the National Museum said, go get her. And we brought her here. They uh, hired a company to take the airplane apart, put it on flatbeds, and bring it in. She came in on four flatbed tractor trailer trucks in July of 2015. And um, first thing we had to do was assess the damage. It was way further than we thought. Uh, wildlife had moved into the plane, including people. Uh, people went in, it was unguarded, and they, this plane was gutted. It was a shell. 
A lot of things went to other B-17 restorations like Shushu Baby being restored at the time and some of the other projects, but people took souvenirs. And then uh, birds living in parts of the airplanes, animals. So when we got her, there was a huge bio problem. We had to clean it up. And then we sent the pieces down on base. They chemically depainted the airplane. And then we started on the restoration project. We are well over 90,000 hours on this plane. Wow. Well over. Um, I've been told I, we all track our volunteer hours just because <laughs> the Air Force will audit us for man, man hours. Yep. They're telling me I just crossed over 12,000 myself. 12, so yeah, it's hard okay. to believe. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, I live here. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but we're, we're coming along well. Phase one, which is the outside of the airplane, was completed last August. We had the ribbon cutting. So phase two, which has been done in lockstep with phase one, most of it. The estimated completion time is another two years. Wow. So, and that's the inside of the airplane. We, the handshake agreement with the uh, National Museum was to return the aircraft back to archival standards as close as possible. Mm -hmm. Some of the things we've been running into uh, that create problems are naturally finding unique items that would have belonged to this airplane being a Block 90. Uh, the technical data is a big issue because they stopped writing the tech data. They knew they had paid for so many. They kept building them after the war, just a few, because they had already paid for them and they just built them out. They stopped writing the technical data. So we have to kind of use our imagination and extrapolate from what we know uh, on this aircraft to, to finish it out. Uh, a lot of what we can make structurally, we can do here uh, at the museum, down at the sheet metal shop. Uh, we have the basic sheet metal tools. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a basic aircraft, so it doesn't take a, a, a scientist to do this. Um, <laughs> and we've got the materials, we've got sheet metal stock, and we can make almost, almost anything structurally, air, aircraft structure, uh, we, can, we can fabricate. Now, the unique things like some of this stuff, this is the chin turret uh, gun, uh, twin 50 caliber Browning M2s. And which is all the aircraft. There were 12 50 caliber M2s on the airplane. Some of them were outfitted with a 13th gun above the radio room. But um, this, uh, this stuff here we didn't have. We had to find, you know, some of it came from England. They still do a lot of casting in England. We don't cast too much here in the United States anymore. But the foot here, that's, that's brought from England. Uh, they, uh, some, of, some of the armament, most of it wasn't in the airplane because they knew it was coming out of the factory. It wasn't going to go to war. So it didn't need armament systems. Um, so B-17 is called the Flying Fortress, correct? Correct. So why, uh, why, why is that? It's <laughs> a good question. So, and here's the answer, uh, and it's in the history books. So there was a gentleman, his last name was Williams, I believe, and he worked for the Seattle uh, Seattle newspaper and in 35 when she flew uh, as a prototype um, when it came into land uh, the, the press was there the media was there it was a big hoop to do and they looked at the guns on this airplane and the Mr. Williams I believe it was his name John Williams I believe could be wrong about the first name um, he looked at that thing land and he said that thing is literally a fortress <laughs> looking at the guns. Boeing liked that and they, can't, they plagiarized and called it the Flying Fortress and it stuck, that name stuck with it. Yeah, definitely. So, so it's a crew of 10. Crew of 10. Right? So you've got, I guess, talk through where basically, you know, just talking about where, where everybody is, what all 10, you know, do you know what all 10 crew members do mm -hmm. and things like that? So the bombardier, we'll start at the nose. Yeah. Well, the bombardier sits up here just after the plexiglass shell, the nose. And he does his job, his primary job is just what it says. He's a bombardier. He is in charge of getting that bomber from the IP point, which the pilot will hand it off to him. He has a, it's like a primitive brick, bomber lease in over control, autopilot. The bombardier is flying the airplane from the IP point to the bomber lease point. He's in charge of, you know, prior to getting to the IP point, he'll go back in the bomb bay and pull all the safety pins, come back up front. He opens the bomb bay doors, toggles the bombs. Get, gets them over the target and then hands it back to the pilot. His alternate job is running on a G model. He's in charge of the chin, tur chin turret okay. and he operates that. He will fold the Norden bomb site forward and if you see that stick up there with the red handles on it, he folds that in front of him and turns on the turret and it operates the uh, chin turret. Okay. 
Okay. He's also in charge of running the right cheek gun. So he's a busy man. Yeah. Of all the crew members, I think he's probably the busiest. Okay. Now he wouldn't be doing all of this at once, of right. course. Right. When he's on that IP, IP to the bomb release point, uh, his sole purpose is flying that airplane and getting it over the, over the target. Okay. And that's his job is releasing the bombs on target. Hmm. Next back at the table, back over his left shoulder back there is the navigator. He gets the aircraft from England to wherever they're going in occupied France or Germany or wherever. Um, he also operates a left cheek gun. Okay. Okay. So going back is the flight deck. You got the pilot and co-pilot. Pilot sits on the left side, co-pilot's on the right. After them is the flight engineer. That's an enlisted position. Um, and the flight engineer, he operates the top turret. There's a top turret, twin 50 calibers up top. Going back past that is the radio room. The radio operator sits in there and he's the communications guy. That's where the 13th gun single barrel would be, uh, well, I think they're, no, they're a single barrel. Uh, that would be above him. Most bombers didn't carry them. Okay. They just lifted, they put the plexiglass shell up top. And uh, some bombers did, but his job would be to run the 50 caliber there. Yeah. So past that is the, uh, now that radio room is on the other side of the bomb bay, or the catwalk. Now past that is the defensive gunner area. You got the ball turret gunner, mm -hmm. two waist gunners, and the tail, tail gunner. So, a lot of gunners. A lot of gunners. A lot of gunners, yeah. You can imagine now why the TV, or the TV, they didn't have TV back then. The, uh, the reporter, when he saw the aircraft land, this is a flying fortress. Right. That right. was his first words. Yeah, so. I mean, all those guns. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> now, you guys, um, you said you got this from Wright Pat Air Force Base? Uh, no, from, from Grissom yeah. Air Force Base. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were talking earlier about um, the engines they came mm -hmm. off of. The Memphis Bell. Most people have heard of, right? So this yeah. thing sitting in the field all those years, and Mother Nature having the way with her, mm -hmm. uh, the engines that were on this airplane were unrecoverable. We couldn't do anything with them. Um, we couldn't even break into them. They were just solid rust. So um, up in the National Museum at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, they were restoring the Memphis Bell at about the same time. Started the restoration, give or take, and they wanted zero time radials. These are our R. R 1820s and um, R meaning radial. 1820 is the cubic inch displacement and nine cylinders. Very reliable engine, uh, um, right cyclone engines is what they are. So um, they wanted zero time radials on the Memphis Bell. They wanted them and they got them. And so they knew we were needing engines, so they, they gave us the Bell's old engines. And we were, we were able to take into them and uh, take them apart, restore them, and get them back on the aircraft. And they'll pull through they'll, okay. the whole compression. Yeah, so. that's a piece of history, isn't it? Yeah, oh, it certainly yeah. is, certainly it really is. is. So how, what are the dimensions of it? Do you know off the top of your head as far as how long? A uh, wingspan, I think it's about 103, 104 feet, okay. 108 feet, give or take. Yeah. Uh, I'm not really familiar with the length of it. Okay. Uh, empty, she weighs about 24 tons. Wow. Uh, a little more than an F-4 Phantom does full. <laughs> um, so bomb load, of, a war load on the aircraft is 6,000 pounds in the bomb bay, but they usually carried about 5,000 in bombs. And in the, the dimensions, and you can look at the bombs over there, 500 pounders and 250 pounders, general purpose bombs, high frag, uh, fragmentation, high explosive. And uh, they're held in the bomb bay by uh, B-11 bomb shackles and the old A-3 trip assemblies that released the, uh, the bomb from the uh, uh, bomb rack. The, um, Let's see, I could talk all kinds of neat stuff about the bomber. Um, the engines, uh, they burn a gallon of oil an hour. They des they're designed to do that. Uh, each engine has its own oil tank in the wing, or behind, in this case, in the, uh, in the cell of the, uh, uh, after the engine, right above the uh, landing gear uh, well in and inside the nacelle of the outboard engines. And each, each, uh, each one holds about 43 gallons, I believe. So uh, Imperial gallons, so I'm not sure, you know, American. Um, <laughs> I have to do my conversion. But it, it burning about a gallon of oil an hour. Uh, each, that's four gallons an hour, yeah. but designed to do that. How long could they stay in flight? So a typical mission was anywhere from eight to nine hours. Okay. So. Okay. Wow. And I guess last question, uh, how many B-17s are out there still? Well, uh, unfortunately, we've, in the last few years, we've lost two flying ones. Um, 909 went down up north in uh, Connecticut, I believe. And then we recently lost, uh, about two years ago, we lost uh, Texas Raiders in, uh, at an air show in uh, Texas. 
So uh, there's flying now, there's just three or f three, I believe. Uh, there was less than 30 total. Most of them don't fly, they're in museums. Yeah. She'll, she'll never fly again. Yeah. So, but so. Only, yeah, 30. This is a pretty significant piece of history. So, it is. We do appreciate you coming and letting us come out here and talk to you about Our it. Our pleasure. And, yeah, thank Our you very pleasure. much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.